How is it going at, at Hudson Yards? How far along are you? Hudson Yards is, is, is really going great. We have about 10 million square feet under construction today. Uh, we have over 5 million square feet of new office space signed and leased, and another 2 million square feet in negotiation. So I'm not quite sure Sam had all the facts together on, on Hudson Yards. Uh, we seem to be doing great. <clears throat> but I will tell you, there's a lot of addition to supply. And so people uh, always keep saying, well, there's too much, and how's that all going to work out? And really, I think the difference is office space is not office space is not office space. The, the, there's, there's a differentiating factor between all the new product that's being developed and what exists. In New York City, 60% of, uh, 50 percent of our office space is over 60 years old in New York City. And so what's happening, companies don't want to occupy those spaces. The way people work today is very different than they worked 50 years ago. And so the office space, we're building the office spaces of the future. Right, so modern technology, efficient layouts, uh, heating and cooling systems, even look at this building here, elevator systems that have capacity to handle the density that you have here today that doesn't exist in the old buildings. And so people are moving from the older towers to the newer towers. But those older towers don't go away. Well, they, they typically get they refurbished do. and somebody moves into so, them. Some of, the, some, of the, some of them that happens and it's actually good for New York City to have class B and lower cost office space because that encourages companies to move to New York, startup companies or technology companies that may not be able to afford the newer buildings, so that's good. Some of it gets repurposed into other types of development, hotels, residential, that's also good for New York City. So it's not a complete addition and we're not competing with necessarily existing stock. The other thing is people have realized that, uh, CEOs have realized that real estate office space is not just about where they occupy and where they work. It's a talent and attraction and retention tool. And so people are moving to locations where their employees want to be, where it's exciting, where restaurants and bars and nightlife exist. And really we've created that whole live, work, play environment at Hudson Yards. So when you go into something like a Hudson Yards project, it's, I think it's the largest commercial real estate project in U.S. history, is that it correct? It is the largest real estate development in U.S. history. R largest real estate. Yeah. That is a multi-year project. Correct. You've got to somehow make projections out. <clears throat> what sort of projections do you look at, for example, for business growth, for business investment, for development of new business to fill that kind of space? Look, we, we obviously are making a very large bet on New York City, right, first and foremost. Um, but we're also, as I said, replacing a lot of existing space. So we're building a better mousetrap. So we're giving people a reason to move from some of the old space that exists to the new space at the same time as, as we bet on the, the macro economics of the future of New York City. And if you look at all the things happening around the world, New York City's become even more attractive than it ever has. So whether you want to talk about Brexit or political strife around the world, that, that is pushing investors to move capital to New York City. That capital flows into New York, is driving business activity, and really um, you know, will, will help us grow. Uh, you're nearing the residential portion of Hudson Yards. Yes. Can you give us some insight on what the rental market is like in New York? Lots of concerns that <clears throat> it's too toppy, bubblicious. I think maybe Tom Barrick mentioned right. something along those lines. Right. <laughs> Well, um, just on, on, on our launch, um, on September 14th, we'll be opening our sales office and begin sales, residential sales at Hudson Yard. So we're looking forward to that. Those are two for sale buildings, not rental buildings. Um, and so, you know, we think, you know, people have talked about the top of the market or prices being too high in New York City. I think what's happened is the consumers become much more discerning as to what they're getting for what price. And I think right now there's a lot of overpriced product on the market or coming to the market in New York City. So really what you need to do is be delivering the right product at the right price and for that there's still lots of demand. On the rental market side, um, we've seen a little bit of uh, uh, top froth in the, in the top end of the market. Uh, there's been a lot of addition to supply and there's still a, a fair amount coming. As you know, some of our real estate tax abatements have expired mm -hmm. over the last year so there was a, a, a rush to get projects completed before the expiration of the program, so a big addition to supply. That has not been renewed yet, so I actually think you're going to see a, a decline in supply, and, and you know, I think rents will pop up after that. When you have a project of this magnitude, whether it's on the, on the rental side or the ownership side, residential, commercial, it has to have an effect on the marketplace overall. I mean, does it drive down prices for others? Does it take market share from some of your competitors? <clears throat> has to come from somewhere. Right. So, well, New York City is growing, as you know. Um, so it, it, it doesn't all have to come from competitors. Um, and, uh, look, I, it's, I think it's similar to the office market. People like to move to newer, better product over time. 
and I think that uh, for, that's what we're delivering. Let's turn now to how you finance things like these, because you also do a lot of financing. Um, where at this point are you looking around the world for financing for this size of a project? Right. And Hudson Yards is very unusual. This is ultimately a $25 billion product um, development, and, and there is not one answer for this. Money for capital for this project comes from all around the world. There's, there's really no part of the world that we haven't uncovered, and it's a combination of sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, uh, debt from institutions, U.S. and foreign. Um, so we've really we've touched on on virtually every every type of fundraising possible for this. So when Tom Barrick was on Bloomberg Television a few days ago, he was saying there were a lot of amateurs also in the real estate market, and that was a concern. That's when he kind of called it bubblicious. Right. Is there a feeling that investors are too overweight uh, commercial real estate and residential? <clears throat> I, I would say actually in the last year or so. In my travels around the world and talking to sovereigns and pension funds, there's actually a movement to push more capital into uh, Is that poor, poor urban markets. Not necessarily. I think it, it goes back to kind of what their alternatives are, right? The interest rates are zero, um, and, and real estate provides a relatively predictable recurring stream of cash flows. Um, and so I think that there's uh, an even greater movement to move uh, capital here in the U.S. But to press on Alex's point, at some point, the drive into real estate because the alternative is worse can make capital actually too freely available, and it can actually put pressure on these projects because you have too much borrowing to support what the cash flow is down the road. No, but I actually, underwriting hasn't really shifted, right? So there's just uh, from, from a debt perspective. So I don't think you're seeing that type of frothiness. The argument that could be made if too much capital flows into a particular city like New York is that prices for stabilized assets become pretty high. I, you know, prices are high here in New York City, um, but I think it's really become a safe haven for capital from around the world. So what do you make of some of the retail products, uh, to go back to Alex's point actually, such as Blackstone has got a big REIT mm -hmm. fund coming up for retail investors. What do you make of that? Are you invested in that? Bill Gross saying hard no. assets. Am I invested? In, are you interested in that? Are you interested in that? Uh, no, we, well, we have a se separately, we have a funds management business. We raise capital uh, for that business as well. From we have, retail? No, we don't do any retail. So all of our investors are um, institutions, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. So what do you think about the retail side getting involved it is, in it's this? A way, it's a way of uh, smaller individuals to be able to access um, core uh, real estate assets that they really don't have a way to do that. Um, you know, whether or not an individual is better off buying a publicly traded REIT, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the benefit is to the individual to have locked up capital versus a, versus public companies. And the locked up part is the important part. That's what I was really asking about, because we saw this in the UK after the Brexit right. vote, as people tried to get out of some of these real estate funds and they got gated. Right. Uh, is there a danger there that people, unlike the institutional investors, individual people don't understand <clears throat> the liquidity limitations of these investments? Right. As an individual, I, I think it makes more sense to invest in, in the public companies. I'm not sure what the real benefit is uh, to putting money into locked up uh, type of investments like that. Um, some of them are not marked on a regular basis. The public companies are marked daily, obviously. Um, some people like to put the money in and just forget about it and, and not have to look at what the values are each and every day. It's just an individual investor decision.